We love a good horror story here on the Green Links channel, and I thought why not dip our toes into some indie horror games that have some real promise. So today we will be covering Hollow Cocoon, a Japanese horror game that is a little confusing narratively without the documents. But don't worry, we'll have you covered. Let's get into it, I hope you enjoy it. A young man named Manito is awoken, as he has just received a phone call from his father. He asks his father why he would call so late, to which he is told his grandmother collapsed and his father wishes to go with Minato to the clinic first thing in the morning to see her. Minato, however, is not very pleased, since he holds some resentment towards his grandmother for skipping his mother's funeral, saying that she means nothing to him. His father understands since he himself cut ties with her for a decade over the same circumstances, but mentions that they are the only relatives that she has left. In fact, Minato is her only blood relative. Now, I am certainly no genealogist, however that means the woman missed her own daughter's funeral. Minato agrees for his father's sake and heads to the clinic the next day. She's still unconscious, but the clinic that she is held in doesn't have the equipment necessary to do the appropriate tests to find out what's wrong, advising that they transfer her to a major hospital. The father gives Minato a key to his grandmother's house to stay in for a moment, while he transfers her to a bigger hospital. Minato catches the bus and we make it to this very secluded Japan countryside. Quite picturesque if I don't say so myself. We can find a small graveyard nearby that belongs to the Miyama family, which turns out to be Minato's mother's family. We arrive at the home as Minato mentions how it's been almost 10 years since he last visited here. The last time was when his grandfather died. There is a letter in the mailbox from the village mayor. It is asking Kinu Miyama, that's Minato's grandmother by the way, to comply with an eviction notice for a local dam construction, saying how it must feel horrible to leave the land her ancestors protected for generations, but the decision was made by the mayor and the village out of necessity. Mentioning how the Miyama family is doing absolute bits in the silkworm business. That's not how it was worded, I added my own flair to that one, but the silkworm business will stay successful at any place, so she doesn't need to stay here. Now, at the end of the letter, I am not entirely sure if this was a threat, because it certainly reads like one. The mayor tells Kinu that whenever substantial amounts of money are involved, ill intentions come with it, so they advise that she makes up her mind quickly. Now, it's been a long day for Minato, and he plans on having a rest before his father picks him up. He prays for his grandfather, mentioning how he died falling down a well, and how his grandmother didn't even tell his mother, her own daughter, about his death. When his mother found out about the death, she went into a depressive spiral, and then she died not long after. We find this talisman that lights up. Apparently, whenever Minato's mother would look at it, it would make her feel sick, and even he didn't like the talisman when he was a child. Call me old fashioned, but if a bunch of my family members felt ill looking at something, I would probably just throw it out. Just let it be a problem for the trash man. And quite frankly, I would not trust any talisman that lights up randomly when you're nearby it. We have a wholesome letter from Grandpa, written to Minato when he was a child. Essentially, Minato wrote to his grandpa telling him that his mother won't buy him a bug collection kit. To which old Gramps points out that he also enjoyed catching butterflies when he was a kid, but learnt not to hurt butterflies by catching them, instead leaving them be and watching them live out their daily lives instead. He tells Minato that he can't buy him the kid he wants, but instead offers to take him to a place where there are plenty of butterflies and dragonflies, just the two of them, so they can have fun together. This gets to the real wholesome stuff. Grandpa Saichi ends the letter telling Minato that he is sad every time they say goodbye to one another. But before Minato goes, he will give him a pat on the head and whisper a magic spell to keep Minato happy until they next meet, promising to see each other in the summer. Damn, it's enough to make a grown man cry. And do you want to know what's even sadder? Minato is surprised by the message because it turns out it was never sent to him because his grandfather died shortly after writing it and was not able to send it to his grandson. Dude, we're like 10 minutes into the game. There's too many feels too early. This is supposed to be a horror game, man. We rest up and see a series of clips, including the famous silkworm, the talisman, and even grandpa and the well that he fell down. Minato remembers back to when he was a child, seeing his grandmother holding a silkworm, asking what it is. She explains to him what they do, and in a very serial killer type of way I would like to mention, saying how they feed the worms a bunch of silk, wait until they make their cocoons before boiling them alive and then taking their silk. 
asking Minato if he feels sorry for them, saying that even if they leave their cocoons, they have no mouths and cannot fly. They just lay eggs and die, and it's humans that have caused this to happen. Well, that just kicked me back into the bleakness of reality. I needed that after the emotional roller coaster that was the grandfather's letter. You can see the mother's death, which involves a train, and Minato watched the whole thing. Holy crap! Anyway, Minato awakes in the dark and begins turning on the lights. We find a message from Yui, Minato's mother, to her dad. It tells a story of when Minato was younger, going to school with an overly sized backpack that made her and her husband laugh, saying that he looked like a giant backpack with legs. She confides in her father, saying how she feels better after drinking water, but she can't bring herself to tell her husband about the situation that she's in, saying how worried and afraid of what will happen if he finds out about it. Hmm. She also brings up the tarnished relationship that she has with her mother, asking why she hates her so much, and apologizes to her dad for burdening him with the constant venting, but mentions how whenever she reads one of his letters and hears his voice, it gives her peace of mind. This grandpa just seems like an awesome dude all the way around, seriously. We head to the kitchen, as Minato mentions how he is thirsty again. Before taking another bowl of water, he questions why he is thirsty all the time. Well, I don't know Minato, I'm not a doctor, but it could simply be dehydration. That is a pretty small bowl there, and you might not be getting the amount of water you need, my friend. Diabetes is also a possibility, or the most likely culprit is just dry mouth, since you did just wake up after all. Hope that helps. Is that a straight up whole ass rooster in grandma's fridge? Head on, feathers on, and everything. What the f- Minato hears some banging from the entrance. It's likely his dad right? We find the brothers and sisters of the rooster in the fridge, and even the crime scene used in the murder. I think we got her, boys. It turns out grandmother has the most regimented daily schedule in all of mankind, dotting down everything that she needs to do during the day, including burning the dead chickens. How many dead chickens do you need to burn to put it as part of your daily schedule? Outside the front door, it's not the father, is that? Oh, God damn it. Uh, the phone begins to ring as we head back inside. It's Minato's dad. It turns out he won't be getting home tonight as he had to speak with the police. They don't think grandma's collapse was accidental or from illness. She had strangulation marks around her neck, and we are at the place it happened. Nice. Minato is thirsty again and wants to head back to the kitchen. It's looking a little less likely on the dry mouth, but we're still within the dehydration levels. Another bowl of water, and that definitely looked like something behind the glass. We go outside to check it out and can find this thing. Eating the goddamn chickens. They are really not getting a break at this house. It's a literal chicken hellscape. We get a shot of the back of this thing and can see some distinctive tattoos. We found a photograph earlier that lines up nicely to this individual. I didn't want to bring it up earlier since it had no context, but... Now our chicken murderer friend here has provided the context that we needed. We run back inside the house as the lights go out, suggesting the power's been turned off. Minato tries to call his dad, but is grabbed by this horrifying reminder of the ring girl that haunted my dreams as a child. After running around a while, we find a bunch of photographs of his grandfather and even his mother, and he states that if his grandfather didn't fall down the well, his mother would still be alive today, wondering just how different his life would be right now. We can find the very well outside near the chickens, but it does make you wonder. Given the circumstances of how grandma was strangled, and then this weird girl with the back tattoos, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that grandpa's death might not have been accidental. Now, let me quickly summarize our next area since it involved a lot of running around doing tasks. We found a notepad with an important code on it. The code allowed us to get into a room that is locked and Minato mentions that he was never allowed in this room when he came here as a kid. So there's bound to be something very interesting in this room. We open grandma's secret room and get greeted by this princess in the hallway. We block the door as it seems to give up on breaking in. Thank God, since I think we were probably one good shove away from being used as a hand puppet. We found some of grandpa's butterfly collection and also a note to grandma from the doctor. It turns out that old grandma has a brain tumor, which explains her symptoms of headaches and forgetfulness. The doctor recommends urgent treatment. We also find the response letter from grandpa to Yui, Minato's mother, for the letter she sent him earlier. He mentions just how proud he is of Yui for the close bond that she has with her family. He also points out that Yui is thirsty, 
to not hold it in. The burden is not her fault and that she should tell her husband her situation since he is a kind man, saying that he will accept her for what she is. The hell does that mean? He also addresses the fact that her mother didn't attend her wedding nor did she care when she became a grandmother, saying that she is like that with everybody, including him. She just sounds like a terrible person to be around. Saying that Kinu could never be a good mother or grandmother, hence why he took Yui out of the house and moved into the town when she was younger. Saying that Kinu has her own reasons for being the way she is, but he does bring up that Yui's husband asked him to leave Kinu and move in with them. It brought a tear to his eye and he was so happy. But now that Minato was born, she no longer needed him by her side. He left Kino alone for a long time. She is a strong woman, but he wants to give her the support that she needs as she gets older. Before signing off, telling his daughter that she is his pride and joy, and that she can rely on him for anything if she's in trouble or feels anxious. Dude, Grandpa Saichi is the GOAT. My favorite character in the story by a mile, and he isn't even alive in the game. Minato finds a storage shed outside. It seems Grandma's secret funhouse is a little bigger than we thought. Inside is a message from Minato's father to his wife's mother, saying that some time has passed since the death of his wife, and is reaching out to her in regards to Minato, who is now 13 years old. He asks Kinu about something that he noticed regarding his son, saying he is unusually thirsty and consumes a substantial amount of water. Right, the mother was also thirsty, and this has been going on for a while now, which means diabetes is looking a little more likely, my friend, but we shall see. He didn't think much of it at first, putting it down to the hot weather, but when the thirst was still constant in the winter, it prompted him to seek medical advice. But the doctor found nothing wrong with Minato. He goes on to say that he remembers Yui also drinking a lot of water, and before she passed, she had discussed with him that she inherited it from her father. He wants to know from Grandma Kinu if her husband spoke about the ailment before his death, asking for any knowledge that she might have on the matter. We do a puzzle with a bunch of scrolls that coincide with a storybook, which unlocks a secret compartment. I see Grandma as a fellow lover of escape rooms. My respect has gone up for her. It leads us to an underground tunnel which has a human-sized cage in it. Alright, my respect is lowered once again. A note inside the cell speaks to a Lord Kyobe, asking for forgiveness, saying that they have seen nothing and told not a single soul. Their lips are sealed. They promise to serve the Miyama family forever, and plead to be released from this place, saying that they are a human being and not to be fed to that creature. Okay, a bit of a substantial turn in the story here, and I am all for it. We find a book that gives insight in the Miyama's silkworm business. It's all the normal stuff, but it does mention that legend has it that the Miyama silkworms originated from the silkworms found sprouting from the body of a Princess Mayu. Ooh. The silkworms are cherished and revered as family heirlooms, and serve as the crest for the family. We find yet another hidden passageway. Dude, Grandma is not messing around here. A nearby book talks about those red talismans that we saw earlier, and that the one down here in the tunnels, apparently it is a protective charm that is speculated to represent the sun deity, as sunlight is believed to purify their negative energies. According to a village legend, when a demon approaches, the talisman emits a radiant light, hurting the demon as it is being exercised. Hold up. Wait a minute. The talisman lights up in the presence of a demon, and Yui and Minato both felt sick whenever they were near it. Well, Minato, my friend, this whole time I thought it might have been diabetes, it turns out it might be the case of you being a demon. We find another photo of who Minato thought was his mother earlier in the house. Instead, it turns out to be somebody called Ayano. Minato mentions again how sick he feels around the talisman as we continue through the house. We have another terrifying run-in with the ring girl again. We can find a family tree of the Miyama family. It shows us some very interesting things. Firstly, we can find our very unloving grandmother down here, Kinu, who is married to our grandfather, who really puts the G in grandpa. We can see that Iano is in fact our grandmother's older sister, and Kyobe, the lord mentioned by the prisoner earlier in the note from the cell, is in fact the father of Kinu and Iano, which makes him Minato's great-grandfather. 
There is also a journal that belongs to our grandfather, but this was written from when he was still very young. It mentions how he has been very fortunate enough to be accepted as the son-in-law to the Miyama family, mentioning how his father and brother looked down on him, considering him weak and spineless. But in the eyes of Lord Kyobe, he is a loyal and trustworthy person. He is awaiting his marriage in the spring, mentioning how ever since he laid his eyes on Iyano, her figure has been etched into his mind. Whoa, plot twist. Capital G, Grandpa, was meant to marry the older sister. He gets a bit excited in the next few paragraphs as he lists all the things that he likes about her appearance, but goes on to mention how he wanted to get Iyano's attention by any means necessary. So he showed her his butterfly collection. Grandpa's got game, I'll give him that. She loved it, saying that she has never seen more beautiful butterflies, but mentions how she doesn't like seeing them trapped or confined, wanting to watch them fly in their natural state. So this is what Grandpa was speaking about when he told Minato about how he stopped catching butterflies because he didn't want to hurt them. A nearby map shows us that this belonged to the Miyama family, and it was their family mansion. I must say, it does look a little bit run down nowadays, could do with a bit of a clean. Oh god! We continue through the mansion and find a note from Yui to her mother, addressing the fact that her mother didn't bother to inform her own daughter of her father's death. She is struggling with the fact that she couldn't give him a final farewell. She goes on to say how she would hide behind her dad because she was scared of talking to her, but now that he is gone, she intends to speak with her in person telling her that on September 21st she will come to visit alone without telling her husband or son. As it turns out, September 21st is the same day that Yui died. We can also find a journal from young Kinu. Now it's time for Grandma's secret entries. She talks about the day that she spoke with Saichi. That's capital G Grandpa, by the way. He gave her a pearl hairpin, saying it would match her with her sister's hairpin. Saichi has heard that neither Iyano or Kinu has ever laid eyes on the sea, so he went and got them both something from the ocean. Considering how close the two of them are, he would be delighted if they both wore them together. Kinu went flush and her heart was racing out of her chest, getting so excited that she had to hide her face. It was the first time anyone but her father gave her a gift, but unlike her father, Saichi's voice was gentle and soft she wished that voice would be by her side forever. Saichi whispered in Kinu's ear, mentioning how Ayano is like a butterfly, clutching at the other hairpin that was intended for her sister. She mentions how it made her feel like her pulse stopped when she realized whom his heart belonged to. Grandma gets a bit intense in the next page, saying that Ayano is beautiful, delicate, and fragile, saying that she could crush her with her bare hands. For now, she is the only one that can be with her, and she is the only one that can place her hand on that slender white neck of hers. Whoa, Grandma, what the hell, man? As we continue to wander the mansion, the woman monster person actually speaks, calling out the name Kinu. Interesting. We find another journal of young Grandpa, as he mentions catching a glimpse of Iyano and Kinu walking together in the front yard of the Miyama mansion saying Ayano had an innocent girlish smile across her face while speaking to Kinu, but as soon as she noticed Saichi, the smile vanished. He had a realization, who she actually had eyes for, whose side she wished to be by, and it wasn't him. Grandma's second journal is not far away. Kinu talks about how she has begun being mean to Ayano, intentionally avoiding talking to her and being unfriendly towards her since she loves Saichi too much not to do so. However, Ayano never asks Kinu why she is being so mean. She always just tells her, while on the verge of tears, that she is sorry and to please forgive her, even though Kinu believes that she has nothing to apologize for. She describes how Ayano and her would often go out during autumn and watch the leaves turn crimson. They would hold hands during the cold wind, and that even recently her sister smiled while they held hands, not holding any of Kinu's recent behavior against her. She has always been kind to her. Kinu could still feel the warmth of their joined hands, but it could be for the last time. Damn, we really got John Wayne grandma over here. Next spring, both of them will be married, Ayano to Saichi and Kinu to somebody else, but her sister asked her to visit the trees again next year. 
Kinu was feeling pretty hurt about the whole thing and told her sister that she would never do this with her ever again. Instead, why not go with Saichi, since she won't need her anymore? She walked away from her sister, hiding the tears going down her face. The last thing that she heard was her sister asking her not to leave her, as Kinu continued to walk off pretending not to hear. Christ almighty! The next journal for Grandma speaks about the moments following Kinu leaving Ayano at the mountain, saying that she just imagined her sister would follow her, as she always did, but she didn't. Kinu begins to regret what she did, saying how she lost her sister due to shallow jealousy and has cried and lived in sorrow for days. She has run out of tears. Months later, Kinu heard someone calling her name from outside, surprised to find her sister Iyano standing in front of the gate. She had been in the mountains for months, but her clothing, sandals and hair were all still pristine. She had lost her ability to speak. Oh, wait, hold up. Wait a minute. You just said she called out your name, yet now she cannot speak. How? Regardless, I will continue. She goes on to mention how she embraced her sister, crying as she did. Her sister's hands were warm, just like how she remembered. She would never let her go again. Grandpa's journal talks about the moment he heard of Iyano's return. He has been unable to meet with her since she returned, with her father telling him that she is unwell. However, he was suddenly summoned to the Miyama residence, stating that Iyano is afflicted with a severe illness, and if he wants to see her, he must marry Kinu and become part of the Miyama family. If he changes his mind afterwards, he will not survive. Damn. Saichi accepted the request, stating that he doesn't care what happens to him as long as he can be with Iyano, accepting Kyobe's offer. He mentions how Iyano was in the depths of a dark cave, trapped in a dungeon, almost unrecognizable. The woman he fell in love with was no longer there, barely seemed human. However, what was even more terrifying was Kinu's reaction to all of this. She was perfectly fine with everything, sitting in the cell with Iyano smiling blissfully. It sent chills down Saichi's spine. We get Kyobe's journal entry and it speaks of how it feels like ages ago since they celebrated Iyano's return. His friend, who is also a doctor, went above and beyond to try and treat Iyano, but she has gradually been losing her sanity and her appearance is deforming. He is watching his own daughter mutate in front of his eyes, saying that when he calls her by her name she just looks at him with blood red eyes and a look of confusion. She no longer recognizes her own father, she's become a monster. He has, however, found an ancient document left by their ancestors that contains the term Princess Possession. It causes women to turn into monsters. Alright, again, I'm not a doctor, and I falsely diagnosed Monado with diabetes earlier, but I think this does sound promising. The cure requires a certain cocoon to treat the ailment. By doing so, you can reverse the transformation, restoring her to her original form as a woman. That puts the whole silkworm business into a new light. They were using the silkworm business to try and cure Iano. Oh, and I think it's pretty damn obvious, but our chicken murder friend is Iano. I know there's at least one person watching this that was actually surprised by what I just said. If it was you, tell me in the comments, because I know you're out there. There is, however, another entry by somebody working at the household that mentions how Lord Kyobe would never sleep, tirelessly reading until his eyes were blood red. It even mentions that he vanished without a trace. There is another Saichi journal, and it speaks about how he once came home and found Yui crying in the living room. She was covered in blood, on her uniform and on her face. In her hands was a lifeless canary, the same one that he gifted her on her 13th birthday. 13th, huh? You remember that note from Minato's father sent to Kinu? He also mentioned that Minato was 13 years old and wanted to address the whole drinking issue. So it's possible that this urge kicks in at that age. Yui told him that she was thirsty. So thirsty, in fact, that she couldn't bear it, so she drank the canary's blood. He had hoped that she would have had a normal childhood, but deep down he knew this day would come. He recalls the day he held baby Yui in his arms. He made a vow that he would do anything for this child. Much like her mother, she is his pride and joy. He told his crying daughter that she inherited her bloodlust from him, hoping to keep her grounded to the world by shouldering the blame himself. He began going to the butcher to purchase blood that he and his daughter would drink together. 
What the hell is going on here? Capital G Grandpa, I still like you, man, but we just hit our first row bump in this relationship of ours. We lead Iano into the room with the red talisman, and it hits her for a critical. She does not like these anti-demon talismans, let me tell you. Saichi's next journal is 20 years after he left with baby Yui in his arms. She has since gotten married, and he has returned to the Miyama family. Upon his return, they neither welcomed nor rejected him. Kinu just said, I see. He knows that Kinu likely resented him since he abandoned her for Yui's sake. He goes on to say that he never forgot about the sisters. To this day, he still thinks about Iano. Shimamura died and he left, which left Kinu the sole caretaker for Iano. Looking after her every day, he cannot approach Iano, let alone touch her. He can only observe from outside the cell. He goes on to mention how even in this state, Iano is always thinking of Kinu and that he might be envying Kinu even to this day. Oh god. He gets excited again, thinking about how she used to look, and mentions how Yui has a striking resemblance to Iyano, which is kind of creepy when you think about it. Saying that his desire to see Iyano again consumes him, and that while Yui looks like her, she isn't the same person, vowing to take on the cocoon theory that his father-in-law found to get her back. Kinu's journal speaks about how Saichi told her that he has discovered a way to cure her sister, pointing out the fact that he once recoiled at the sight of her sister and abandoned them to flee into town with Yui. She goes on to mention that she doesn't view Ayano as ugly. Her hair is still long and sleek, and she kept her lips red also. Kinu is still jealous of her beauty and suggests that Ayano is as beautiful as ever. She feels that Saichi is trying to split the sisters apart, and she cannot bear it. She will not allow him to take Iyano away from her. She threw the pearl hairpin that he gave her down the well, and asked him to retrieve it. He agreed. She goes on to say that as he looked into the well, she embraced him from behind, before pushing him into the well. It was the first and last time she ever touched Saichi. Whoa, wait. I get the murderous grandma. I saw that coming from a mile away. So that's not what surprised me, but the line of how it was the first and last time she touched Saichi got me thinking. Isn't she Yui's mother? Isn't she lowercase g grandma? If she never touched Saichi prior, it would suggest to me that Yui is not her daughter, which would explain her cold indifference when it comes to her own daughter and grandchildren since they aren't even hers to begin with. I'm a little worried about where this is going, I won't lie. We can find a picture of Iyano with her creepy as all hell spider eyes on the left side of her face, along with a journal of the doctor that treated her after she returned. He inspected her the night that she returned and noticed no scratch on her, despite being out in the mountainscape for months. The next entry is a month later, and he mentions how she still does not speak, and just spends all of her time in her room staring into space. Whenever somebody speaks to her, she only glances at them, but is visibly happy when Kinu is by her side, opting to lean against her sister. The doctor mentions how they lost their mother when they were young, and it's likely why they share such a close bond, even for sisters, relying on each other for that missing piece of the family. The doctor notes that some things are out of the ordinary for Ayano. Firstly, she drinks water like she's going to die of dehydration. Oh god, it's... It's definitely going down the road, I think it is, isn't it? She hasn't slept nor eaten since she's returned, and hasn't even gone to the bathroom. Not to mention that Lord Kyobe opened up the door to Ayano's room to show her the cherry blossoms that were in full bloom. Instead, when the sunlight hit her, she let out a piercing scream and crumbled to the floor. Her skin inflamed as if she had severe sunburn, and beneath the skin was raw, reddened flesh. She is constantly losing weight, but at the same time, growing taller. Well, her limbs are becoming elongated. The doctor points out that she used to be petite, but is now taller than he is. No matter how injured she gets, she heals within days with no scars remaining. He notes that there are moments when Miss Iano stares at him. Her sunken, hollow eyes just glare at him like she was the predator and he was her prey. The next entry mentions how Lord Kyobe has secluded Iano and is completely isolated now. Kinu is the only one that cares for her, but tragedy struck. Iano bit and killed a servant, 
she ate the poor woman. The doctor told Kyobe that there was nothing he could do for his daughter, which distressed Kyobe deeply, pleading for the doctor to not give up on his Iano. He faked Iano's death certificate, something that he only did for the sake of his friend, Kyobe, and the situation that they're in. They can find Iano in the dungeon below the mansion. The next entry is four years after her return. She remains imprisoned and survives off of blood from chickens, cows, and even sometimes humans. Her beautiful figure is gone, her nose has receded, and her left eye is punctured. In its place are those creepy spider eyes that have emerged. On her back, there are markings that we saw before, but it turns out that they are silkworms. I had no idea when I first saw them. I thought they were moons, but there you go. The Doctor cannot see Ayano unless Kinu is present, otherwise she would just tear him apart. Kinu told the Doctor that her sister is experiencing stomach cramps, to which the Doctor checked and noticed movement within her abdomen. He has noticed over time that there was a swelling of her abdomen ever since she returned, but thinking initially that it was just attributed to malnutrition. But it seems she was pregnant and has been for six years. Two years later and the doctor points out that it's been nine years since she's returned. His dear friend Kyobe has vanished and tonight, along with Kinu, they will extract the child from Ayano's stomach. And due to her body transformations of the last nine years, she is completely incapable of giving birth. So their only option is to surgically open her abdomen and remove the child. A C-section. He is scared that the child will not resemble a human before noting that, let's be honest, it's not going to be born human at all. Whoa, that is a lot to take in. So that confirms that Kinu is not the mother of Yui, or the grandmother of Minato, which explains her indifference towards them. But in fact, Ayano is Yui's mother, and she is the new lowercase g grandma. It also explains why Yui and Minato feel ill around the anti-demon talismans, since they carry genetically whatever is going on with Ayano. Who would have thought? But it still leaves the question, who is the father? Another puzzle down and we find another Kinu journal. Not grandma anymore, right? Just remember that. Previously grandma, but not anymore. It notes how Yui died, saying that she threw herself onto the railroad tracks. Exactly how we saw it happen when Minato dreamt of her earlier. Kinu knew that this would happen, since Yui, who bore such a striking resemblance to her frail sister, wouldn't be able to bear it. The day that Yui visited Kinu, she was all dressed up, much like Iyano would be, and her disdain came rushing back. She was the spitting image of Iyano, who she loved and despised, but Yui was just a mere imitation of her sister. Yui asked Kinu why she hated her so much. Kinu noted that it was said using the same face and voice as her sister. Kinu escorted her to the dungeon and showed her the truth. Kinu is not her mother and Saichi is not her father. She was cut from the womb of that abomination. Well, oh well, the tune has changed for Kinu. She previously mentioned how she thought Ayano's beauty was just as it was before she went missing, but now she addresses her as an abomination. I have my thoughts on this, which I'll get to later. She calls Yui a monster, and that her bloodlust is only natural for one and how Saichi lied about it coming from him. For years, he would choke down blood from the butcher alongside her, a monster child. After seeing the truth, Yui didn't scream, didn't cry. She just stood there. Kinu notes that she didn't know what Yui did afterwards, nor did she even care what happened to her. Dude, Kinu is the most despicable person. It's insane. You can probably guess... Minato is a little bit concerned about the whole monster diagnosis, since he is technically the grandchild of one, but also technically he is better off than his mother, since he is at least half human on his father's side. We now find an Iyano journal that takes us back before the mountain incident, but when Kinu was all hot and bothered by Saichi. Kinu told Iyano that she was like a butterfly, the same thing that Saichi mentions to Kinu earlier and it left Iyano in tears. She is pained that Kinu is suffering because of her, and all she wants to do for her sister is to make her happy. She goes on to say that she isn't like a butterfly, but instead a silkworm. She was given a mulberry tree in a warm silkworm room, never needed to leave and always had someone to care for her. 
Her body dissolves within the cocoon, and she dreams without being able to fly, just clinging to life. But as long as Kinu is by her side, she is content. Ayano contemplates if it would be better off if she just left, since Kinu could be with Saichi, but she just can't bring herself to do it, since the closer the wedding gets, the more she realizes how little time they have left together, and she wants to cherish her remaining time with Kinu. She knows what will happen to the silkworms once they leave the silkworm room, and it's what she's afraid of. They get boiled, by the way, if you've forgotten from earlier. If it were up to Ayano, she would be by her sister's side forever. Look, the bond the sisters share is great and all. Very toxic on the side of Kinu, but still. Why do they think that they can never see each other again once they're married? I mean, you can still hang out from time to time. Family visit here, birthdays, you can make it work. We find yet another secret hallway with a bunch of talismans on the walls. Whoever set this up does not want Grandma Ayano to visit. We can find the cave that Ayano was once imprisoned in, along with a variety of scribbled notes. Ayano feels Kinu has abandoned her, and that she loves Saichi. She doesn't want Kinu to cry, and instead just wants to die. We get back into the weird silkworm analogies as she mentions how Kinu is so pure. <laughs> which is a bunch of BS, and they shoot threads and form cocoons together. Inside the cocoons, they dissolve and merge together as one. I think that this is her analogy for a hug, by the way. Ayano feels lost. She stops being herself, forgetting a lot of things, before saying her memories replace Ayano's. She keeps eating her. Ayano wants water blood red water there is an old man standing outside her cage saying ayano is he talking to her she thinks he is the old man entered the cell stroking her head and crying kinu laughed and said bon appetit kinu gave her tasty water and called her with a gentle voice ayano is happy kinu is precious Okay, so Ayano is turning into a straight-up Smeagol with that last line. But if you thought that Kinu couldn't get any worse, we have a surprise for you. She caused her sister to end up as a monster. Indirectly, anyway. She killed Saichi, capital G Grandpa. She killed her niece, indirectly, and is now responsible for the death of her own father as well. The final letter is Ayano pleading for somebody to save her. She is scared since she is forgetting Kinu. She ate almost all of her. Who is she? She asks her not to eat memories of Kinu. She wants to die before forgetting. There is another book sitting within the cell. This time it's Kinu's will. She poisoned some blood that she gave to Ayano, which caused her to vomit blood and stopped moving. Kinu is sick and dying. Her arms withered like a tree branch. Killing Ayano is the only thing that she could do, since when she is gone, who will care for her sister, bathe her, brush her hair, and worry that they will just call her a crazy monster and will be treated as subhuman? Hold up. Firstly, she held her own sister in an underground cave dungeon, which I think counts as subhuman treatment. Also, Kinu herself called Ayano an abomination. The hypocrisy here. It turns out Kinu is also losing her memory due to her brain tumour and is worried about forgetting her sister. She at least acknowledges that she killed her father, Saichi, Yui, and now her sister and is now just sort of dying in pain. She apologises before noting that she treated her poorly out of envy, despite knowing how vile it was. She admired everything about her sister and that's what caused her to despise her. Ayano knew the real Kinu, cruel and merciless but loved her anyway. As they grew older, when the sun would set, Ayano would light the house up for Kinu so she wouldn't fall. Ayano would massage Kinu's old wrinkly hands. And while Ayano's mind was almost completely void of memories, she never forgot about Kinu. They found happiness together, but it now comes to an end. The final note states that Kinu does not know what happened to Ayano that day, nor does she know who the she is that Ayano writes about, but like her, she wishes to dissolve into a cocoon and become one with her sister. Ayano appears again, and she is not very thrilled about her grandson's visit. During the fight, we collapse the dungeon, but Ayano saves Manito at the very last moment, pushing him away from the rock. 
she is stuck beneath the rock, calling out for her sister. Minato picks up a rock and you are left with two choices, kill her or spare her. Now we will cover both the endings, so don't you worry. Starting with the kill option, Minato gets to work with the rock as we time jump a year into the future. We can see him taking flowers to that same family graveyard as he addresses Kinu who has died after her attempt with the noose. Minato mentions how he will never forgive Kinu and that he has not told anyone about Iyano, not even his own father, pointing out that even after Kinu poisoned her sister, Ayano still saved Kinu after taking her down from the noose, carrying her to the entrance to be found. Minato mentions how he killed Iyano, or at least he thought he did. Oh no. Ayano has disappeared. When he returned to give her a proper burial, she was gone. The only thing remaining was a cocoon and a bunch of white silkworms. He mentions how Ayano is likely still looking for her, before stating that the area will soon be at the bottom of a lake, remembering the town's plans on creating a dam. Minato turns around and sees Grandma Ayano just standing there, before stating that even if his thirst for blood pains him for the rest of his life, he will just endure it and live as a human. Now to spare her. Minato puts down the rock and he calls Iyano his grandmother for the first time. He calls his father to let him know that he is dropping out of college and intends to live in Kinu's house from now on. His father is horrified, asking if his son plans to just spend his whole life in that house just like Kinu did, to which Minato says that this is where he belongs. Also, since they can't get him to sell the property, the town had to cancel the construction of the dam. His father pleads with him to come home, saying he doesn't care if he drops out of college, he just wants to speak with him. Coldly, he tells his dad that he wouldn't understand since he's just a human, and to just simply forget about him and never call him again. Dude, Minato has literally turned into Kinu. A bell tolls as Minato has to make dinner. And we see those poor chicken's torments continue with this ending as he prepares dinner for Ayano and himself. He finds Ayano crying as he reminds her that Kinu is dead, but there is nothing to worry about since he will now be with her forever and ever. And that ends the story of Hollow Cocoon. What an indie game. I really enjoyed the story for this one. And can you believe that this game is only two and a half hours long? Now, there are a few questions that remain unanswered, which I could not find the answer to. The most blaring of all was who the father of Yui was, and how Iyano turned into a creature. Now, there is a storybook that could be found, that was a short story used in a puzzle but was written by Iyano and Kinu when they were children. It says, Once upon a time there lived a nice old man. He found a mysterious boat in the mountains. Inside the boat there was a princess. The old man cared for the princess, but she caught a disease and passed away. The princess's body turned into a pure white silkworm. The silkworm continued to spin its thread until it became a large cocoon. Now the reason I felt this necessary to bring up is the fact that during the ending, in which Minato technically fails to kill Ayano, there is a white cocoon remaining where she once was, surrounded by pure white silkworms, just like the princess in the story. And... Within the story, it is mentioned how an old man found the same princess inside of a boat in the mountains. Ayano also went missing in the mountains. It begs the question, if an old man found Ayano, cared for her during the months that she was missing, she died due to a disease and was reborn from the white cocoon, much like she did during the ending. Not to mention the treatment for the disease. Kyobe mentions how within the ancient documentation that a cure can be found within a certain cocoon. I do wonder if the special cocoon in question is the one that she has after she dies. The idea of having to kill her to save her. Since, as they said themselves, after a silkworm leaves its cocoon, it gets boiled. But it still doesn't explain the mysterious pregnancy, but I feel parts of the game were meant to be a little mysterious. Maybe there'll be a hollow cocoon too, you never know. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please write who you think was the most interesting character in the story. Remember to leave a like and subscribe for more content in the future. Until next time, peace.